All right, today we are talking about the church. In technical terms, this is called ecclesiology. Um, and I'm going to talk about ecclesia and ecclesiology in a few minutes. Uh, but in order to get into that, let me give you a definition for church that I think is a good one. This is from Richard Baxter, who was a 17th century uh, Puritan pastor and theologian. Baxter wrote, the Christian church is the fellowship of all those who, in response to the apostolic message proclaimed in the word and sacraments, confess their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a faith that is the gift of God's electing grace and that works by love, this love transcending the barriers of class, race, sex, culture, and nation, so that the church may be likened to the one body having many members under Christ who is its head. A very complete definition. But that's what I like about it, is that he really does give you a sense of the scope of the definition, where it comes from, um, and I like that definition. Okay, Let's talk for a minute, I want to explain to you what ecclesiology is, because um, the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology in its simple sense, is uh, the study of the church's origins, its relationship to Jesus, its role of sal in salvation, its discipline, its destiny, and its leadership. It's the study of everything having to do with the church. Now, interestingly enough, the word ecclesiology, uh, which means this, this ecclesia, we're going to talk about it in a little while, means assembly, literally, the gathering. But it began to be associated with the Christian church especially. especially. So ecclesiology is the study of the assembly of Christians together. Originally, it was, it was first quoted in the 1830s in England, that word ecclesiology, and it actually meant, at first, the science of church buildings and decoration. It had to do with the altar guild kind of stuff more than it did with the actual theological sense. But ecclesiology now means, is very seldom used in that regard. It, ecclesiology now means the, the study of the theology of the church. Alistair McGrath, who is one of the very best Protestant theologians working today, his work, it, Alistair McGrath, um, has written a lot of wonderful books like Why We Need Theology, which is a, a, for lay people. Uh, he was a professor when I was a, I was a consultant with Denver Seminary. He is a professor there. I think he's somewhere else now, but he's really good. He wrote this, Ecclesiology is a term that has changed its meaning in recent theology. Formerly, the science of the building and decoration of churches, what I just said, promoted by the Cambridge Camden Society, the Ecclesiological Society, and the Journal of the Ecclesiologist, all three English things. They were the ones that first coined that term. Ecclesiology now stands for the study of the nature of the Christian church. Just like Christology is the study of the person and nature of Jesus, ecclesiology is the study of the nature of the church. Right? Clear on that? Yes. <laughs> there are a number of different questions or issues that are addressed in ecclesiology as a theological study. Um, like, um, who is the church? Who is included as members of the church? That may seem like an obvious question, but it's not an obvious question, depending upon whether you ask a Roman Catholic, or somebody from an Eastern Orthodox Church, or a Charismatic, or a, you know, a Presbyterian. All right? Those answers will differ. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, what is the relationship between the believer and the church as a whole? What is the authority of the church? Uh, what does the church do? What's the function and activity of the church appropriately? How should the church be governed? We talk about church polity, which is the, the process by which you decide how the church is governed and maintained. The, if you will, the politics of the church. Politic meaning how things are governed, how things are run. Um, then, what are the role of the spiritual gifts in the church? How does the church's new covenant relate to the covenants that were expressed in the past, like the covenant of the law given to the Jews? And what's the ultimate destiny of the church in um, Christian eschatology? Let me say right up front that a huge split or difference in the understanding of ecclesiology as a study happened, and you would think this is obvious, in the Reformation. Because Martin Luther in the Reformation, after trying very hard, to just, you know, Luther did not want to split off from the Catholic Church. That was not his goal. He was a Catholic monk. He was committed to the church, but the church was really messing up, and he wanted them to straighten up and do it right. When he, kept, when he would not back down, but kept saying, no, you need to fix these problems, and they excommunicated him, and, they, and he was fearful he was going to be um, burned as a heretic, and ended up hiding out and spent his time writing the, the German uh, translation of the Bible. Um, 
Luther ended up, after all of that, saying that the Catholic Church had, and I quote here, lost sight of the doctrine of grace, and so has lost its claim to be considered as the authentic Christian church. By losing the clear sense, as Luther saw it, of what Scripture, the New Testament says, is the basis of salvation by, by grace through faith, because the Catholic Church had completely lost sight of that, Luther says the Catholic Church has lost its claim to be considered the authentic Christian Church. On the other hand, the Catholic Church feels like somebody who is not of the Roman Catholic Church feels like someone who's not a member of the Roman Catholic Church is not really a Christian. Now, that's the the the, um, the strict doctrine of the Church. Most Catholics, if you ask them that, would not be that stern about it, but that is the doctrine. Likewise, the Orthodox. Churches, in fact, the Eastern Orthodox Church, which are the big Orthodox churches, Russian Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox, etc., they would say that if you're not part of the Eastern Orthodox Churches, you're not really a Christian. And the Oriental Orthodox Churches, which is a different, it's like the Ethiopian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, they're smaller, but they form a different body because they don't agree with all of the creeds that the Orthodox Church, the you know, Eastern Orthodox does. They say if you're not a member of the uh, Oriental Orthodox Church, you're not really a Christian. So we're going to talk about what, what really constitutes a uh, Christian in terms of who belongs to the church. I want to start, uh, I'm going to get into the, the biblical definition of the church first in the book of Acts. And uh, some of the different elements like the leadership and organization and all of that from the book of Acts. And then I'm going to kind of shift gears and move over into Pauline theology. And what does Paul say about the church? Um, from the major or the main epistles of Paul, that if you're in the survey class, we looked at, you know, we've been looking at Paul's epistles the last couple of weeks. In, in like in Romans, in uh, Philippians, in, in Ephesians, he just sort of suggests to us from things he says. I mean, we can sort of derive how he sees the church working and the nature of the church. But then you get to the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, and Paul is very pointed about uh, some aspects of the church because he's teaching Timothy and Titus, or instructing them at least, uh, here's how, here's what you're looking for in an elder, here's what you're looking for in a deacon, and a lot about how the church needs to be run. He is teaching them how to be pastors. So he talks more in the pastoral epistles about what the church should look like and what, what constitutes the church, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The first thing before I get into the church in and Acts and the church in Paul is I want to give you what are called the four marks or attributes of the church. And you've all been in a church at all. You've all said these things. The Nicene Creed, to a, to a slightly varied degree, the Apostles' Creed, all state what we believe about the church. The Nicene Creed says we believe the, in, in the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Those are called the four marks or the four attributes of the Christian church. Let me tell you what those things mean. I actually have had people stop me after the first time they come to our church and hear us do the Nicene Creed and say, why do you guys say you're Catholic, for instance? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, when we say that the church is one, the followers of Jesus Christ are considered one in their belief in one God and in one Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Catholic church... And the Nicene Creed was written when the Catholic Church was just sort of defining itself as the Catholic Church. This is in the 300s when, when Christianity was first made legal. It wasn't made the official church yet, but under Constantine, in the 300s, at the Council of Nicaea, the church was made legal. Previously, it had been illegal under the other Roman emperors. Then later on, the Emperor Theodosius made it the official religion of the empire. But uh, the Nicene Creed is the expression of what the, the faith is supposed to be, and it says it is one. Now, that meant that all the believers in all the different churches who, who claimed to be Christians, according to the definition of the Council of Nicaea, were considered part of the church. The church was one. We interpret that today as saying that all believers in Jesus Christ, in fact, all those who, who have proclaimed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, quoting Romans 10, that they are Christians. In all times, in all places. It doesn't matter whether they're Baptists or Presby uh, Presbyterians or Catholic. If they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that, they, that Jesus Christ is Lord, they are Christians. That's our belief. The Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Oriental Orthodox Church don't agree with us. They think if you aren't part of their church, I'm, I'm quoting the strict doctrine now, not what the lay people might say, then they believe that you aren't really part of that one church. 
uh, I had the interesting experience, and I've mentioned before, that I was the only Protestant on the board of the American Chesterton Society. G.K. Chesterton, great hero of mine, was a Catholic. He became a Catholic later in life. Um, and everybody's allowed one mistake. <laughs> um, but, and that's sort of what I would say. In fact, the first meeting that we had, our dear friend Carolyn and I, dear friend of ours, uh, Dale Alquist, who founded the American Chesterton Society, he introduced me to the other board members and we're all talking, and, um, and they all smiled and said, this is going to be kind of interesting because Ross is Protestant. Everybody else was Catholic. And I said, oh, it's better than that. I'm a Calvinist. <laughs> Which, you know, to them was like, well, one of those, one of the dear brothers who was on the board of the Chesterton Society, at one point, I was, they were always pushing me. You know, Dale would say things like, Russ, you're going to make a great Catholic. And I could say, Dale, I'm not. I'm a Protestant theologian. Okay? <laughs> Um, and one of the brothers, one of the, my friends and uh, board member, he said one time, Ross, we keep pushing you because we want you to be part of the church. And I said, I am part of the church. I just live in a different neighborhood of the church than you do. Okay? But that is the sense of belief of the Catholic Church, is that unless you're Catholic, you really aren't part of that one which the Nicene Creed uh, declares. Um, and that, that's still held to be true. I mean, up until the Vatican II, there was no patience for that at all. Vatican II declared that Protestants were, who believed in Jesus were separated brethren. There actually, in recent years, have been a little bit of withdrawal from Vatican II in that regard. Okay, so the sense is that Origen once said that uh, unless you have the Catholic Church as your mother, you cannot have God as your father. I mean, that's how serious it was. So you need to understand there are different interpretations of what it means to be church. We claim the Nicene Creed as well, because it was written before there was any differentiation between Catholic and Orthodox and Protestant. All right? In fact, again, some of my other friends on the Chesterton board said, well, you know, what, do you have authority? And I said, on Scripture. He said, yeah, but anybody can interpret Scripture anyway unless you have the church to interpret it for you. And I said, no, it's been interpreted for us, like in the creeds. He said, what creeds? And I said, for example, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. He said, oh, but those are our creeds. And I went, no, they're my creeds, too. They were written before there wasn't us and them. You know, so you get the idea. My point that is that there is some difference. The second point is that the, the church is holy. By that, we do not mean that the, the followers of Jesus are without sin, which is what some people would think holy means, but rather it means we are set apart for a special purpose by and for God. The New Testament says you are a holy people, a special priesthood. Okay, So we are holy as the church. The third point is that we are Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. When we use it in the creed, you will notice it has a small c. It does not mean Roman Catholic. It means universal. And again, in the same way that one means all uh, believers everywhere, Catholic means that the followers of Jesus Christ are the church Catholic or the church universal made up of all people everywhere and at all times who believe in and profess Jesus Christ as Lord. That's a little redundant with the one in some ways. I'm sure you could draw, tease out some theological differences, but it's effect saying the same thing, that it is universal. And then we are all part of one. And finally, the church is apostolic, which means that it is based on the continuity of the teaching of the apostles of Jesus, especially as recorded in and taught by Scripture, because the you may not make the association between the New Testament, uh, this is after all New Testament theology we're studying here, and um, the apostles, but the writings in the New Testament are all either by apostles or by people who were associated with apostles and accepted by them. For instance, the four Gospels. Matthew and John were apostles, part of the original twelve. Mark, who is John Mark, is really, it was a secretary and assistant to Peter, and it, it, tradition has always held that the Gospel of Mark is pretty much the Gospel according to Peter. And it was accepted and received by the early church as being of God because of Mark's association, first with Paul and, and Barnabas, and then later with Peter. And then you get Luke, who was a companion who wrote according to not only what he experienced from Paul and his travels with Paul, but through his interaction. And it says he investigated this. He interviewed all of these people, including apparently uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, because he quotes what Mary was thinking and feeling in several places. Um, she, she stored up all these things in her heart, for instance. How would he know that unless he spoke to her? So Luke was always, has always been accepted as being apostolic, even though Luke was not an apostle. He was writing from the testimony of the apostles. Okay? So it is apostolic. 
one holy, catholic, and apostolic. That's our markers or attributes of the church. Any questions about that? Did you want to say anything about Paul? About Paul? Yeah, the argument that he made when he saw Jesus in spirit. So well, we're going to talk about the apostles, yes. I'm going to do Acts, now I'm going to go into Acts, and then I'm going to get a Pauline, you know. Yeah. Paul's claim that he was an apostle, he defended it rigorously, because that was the source of his authority. And to be an apostle was one who had authority over the church. Since he was planting churches, that was important to him. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I should also say that down through history, uh, the, a comment from Protestants, or a, a, an approach by the Protestant uh, church, has been to recognize that the church of Jesus Christ through history is made up of two parts. There is the church visible and the church invisible. The church invisible means um, all of the, it's sort of the, um, the, the one, it's in it, all of the people down through history who have been united to Christ through their faith in Him, again, Romans 10, who have believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, all of those people who have a true faith in Jesus are part of the invisible church and have eternal life with Him. The reason they, they drew a distinction then is because the visible church means all of those people who visibly, to our awareness, have joined themselves with the church, whether they truly are in faith with, of Jesus Christ or not. The reason, the reason that difference is made is because there have been some people who profess to be Christians, who profess to be believers in Jesus, who ended up doing horrible things, who ended up clearly violating that faith. So the idea of thinking that there is a church invisible, which is the spiritual side, which is in, in, in violet in terms of people who, who believe in Jesus. Then there is the visible church, which means the gathering of people, not all of whom may actually be serious about believing in Jesus. And there's been that differentiation. Again, one of the reasons I mention that is because the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches, they believe that that distinction is not legitimate. Because they believe that the visible church, the manifestation of the church on earth that you can see, has spiritual authority... So they're unwilling to separate that from the church invisible. Okay. In other words, if you started saying that not all of these people who are here that you can see may really be committed to Jesus and part of the church invisible, that would cause you to begin to question whether or not the church that you can see and the people who are in it are truly supposed to have authority. Okay. And so you can see why that would create a problem for them. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Ron? Uh, it is the fact that the Roman Church has such a long history that they have that equal to Jesus, their traditions? Well, see, my response to that would be the same thing to the, to the friend who said that the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed was their creed. I've got just as long a history as they do. In fact, you know, because the faith of the fathers, if you will, the apostolic age, the post-apostolic age, up until the Reformation, I have just as much claim to, to the history that occurred before the Reformation as they do. Those are my antecedents as well. I'm not saying I no, no. go along with this, I'm saying that that's their belief. That right, just right. As that they have that history, and we started in the 1500s, is what they would say. And that's why my friend said, okay, but those are our creeds. Because they believe that the Protestant Church, as a, as a splinter sect and a heresy, started 500 years ago. And before that, we have no claim to any of the traditions of the Church. Carolyn? Maybe I'm misunderstanding your comment, Ron, but it, it, the, the thing about the equality of the traditions with, for example, Scripture. Right. I think that's a kind of a difference, yeah. too, that you're probably going to get into. Well, and that's true. Well, let me go ahead and say something about that right now. The two biggest theological differences between Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, even though they don't agree with each other, they still both have these differences, and Protestantism, and one of the reasons that Protestantism occurred I'll just use the Catholic Church, I won't get into orthodoxy, for one reason, I don't know as much about orthodoxy, to be quite honest. Um, and I'm not picking on Catholicism, we're talking about the history of the development of theology of the Church, and so we have to talk about those differences, okay, but I'm not trying to pick on them. I have, I have my friends who are Catholics, I know love the Lord, and I will look forward to, to going neener neener to them in heaven, if they got some of this stuff wrong, okay. Um, but, anyway, they will be in heaven, that's the point. That's not picking on them at all. No. <laughs> 
I'm not like they haven't picked on me. You've been That's there. That's true. <laughs> um, the Catholic Church, two of the two things that we as Protestant and the Catholic Church differ primarily on is one, the um, acquisition of grace. And I may have said something about this before. The Catholic Church believes that grace, that is grace unto salvation, is the property of the church. And that it is the church that dispenses it. Which is why they have always said, if you were not a member of the church, you could not be saved. Because you couldn't get grace if you weren't a member of the church. They specifically believe that grace is dispensed by the church through the sacraments. And since that's so important, that's why they have seven of them instead of two. Lots more opportunities to access grace. Um, they even they have a, a sense of the great saints of the church who have had more grace than they needed. When they died, the church inherited their extra grace, and the church could distribute it as they wanted. I'm not making this up. No. <laughs> okay? And so the, the idea that if you are not part of the church, you can't receive grace. If you can't receive grace, you can't be saved. All right? This is the biggest thing that Martin Luther had a problem with. And the selling of indulgences, you know about that? I mean, one of the things that Tetzel, who was this famous guy who was selling indulgences in, uh, in Luther's time, um, they believed that in order to raise money, in this case to build St. Peter's Basilica, that they could sell extra grace to get people out of purgatory, for instance, or to save the soul of someone who otherwise would be questionable. They could per you could purchase, literally, with money by the grace. In fact, Tetzel had this saying, that uh, when the coin within the coffer rings, the soul from out of purgatory springs. <laughs> well, Luther didn't agree with that, right? <laughs> so, and nor do we. Now, selling of indulgences doesn't happen anymore. I mean, the Catholic Church has cleaned up its act on a lot of that. But it's still the case that the official doctrine of the Church is that it is through the Church that grace is distributed, not directly. We believe by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, which would include buying it, not at works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So this is a major difference between Catholicism and Protestantism. Bob? Well, to be fair, I think there's a wide spectrum of belief now in the Catholic Church. I'm talking about the official doctrine of the Church. Yeah. Individuals might disagree with that. Right. But the official doctrine of the Church is still that grace comes through the Church, through the sacraments of the Church, through the receiving of the sacraments from the Church. I, I think I said that earlier, that if you ask a lay person in the Catholic Church, they, they probably wouldn't, for instance, say, if you're not a Catholic, you can't be saved, unless they're a very strict Catholic. But that's different than what is the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Okay, is that fair? Now, the second difference between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church that's most significant, and that, I think, is what Ron and, and Carolyn were getting at, is the authority of the magisterium. Magisterium is the hierarchical structure. It's from the, the Pope and the Cardinals and the, and the bishops and the priests, okay? It's the official structure of authority within the church, of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church maintains that the magisterium, the, the people in authority in the church down through history, is equal in authority to, to Scripture. So, in other words, if the Pope, especially if he has declared something ex cathedra, which means from the chair, Ex cathedra means he speaks from the chair, which is the only time in which the Pope is considered to be infallible, and he hasn't done that in a long, long, long time. Not everything the Pope says is supposed to be infallible, but it is considered to have authority. The authority of the of the, the men who are the in charge of the Catholic Church down through history is considered in the Catholic Church to be equal to the authority of Scripture. We do not believe that as Protestants. We believe that the authority of Scripture is unequal, that it always trumps everything else. The Catholic Church believes those two are equal and that they have to be balanced against each other. Which, you say, how does the Catholic Church come up with some of these doctrines? Well, if it's not something that the uh, New Testament or, well, anywhere in the Bible, if it's not something the Bible specifically says it is not true, then the Catholic Magisterium has the authority equal to Scripture to say that it is true. For instance, some of the things having to do with the Virgin Mary. You know, the, the, um, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, that Mary was born without sin. These are not things that are in the Bible, but these are things that have been determined, they believe, you know, given messages given by God through to the Catholic authorities, and they have declared this to be doctrine, and therefore it's equal in authority to the things we find in Scripture. That's why there are some differences there. Now again, both of these things are important to understand in terms of the church. Because we're talking about why we do have different interpretations. Why is there a Protestant church? The, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church is the largest ecclesiastical body in the world. The second largest ecclesiastical body in the world 
is the, um, the Eastern Orthodox churches, which is Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Macedonian Orthodox, etc. Now, the Protestants would be the second biggest group, but they don't, we're not considered one group because we're so split up. All right? it's, it's almost as though we said, okay, we decided to split off the Catholic Church, and let's see how many more times we can divide ourselves up. So that we're no longer considered one ecclesiastical body, or we would be the second biggest after the Catholic Church. I remember I had a friend in high school who didn't believe it one time when a teacher said that the Catholic Church was bigger than the Baptist Church. <laughs> because he said, hey, there's a Baptist Church on every corner. You have to drive all the way to Johnson City to see a Catholic Church. <laughs> but, you know, you didn't know. But that's, that's sort of the case. Okay. Are we clear on that? Does that answer what you were getting at? Okay. Um, all right. Now let me get into some lecture. <laughs> That was just telling stories there. Um, I'm going to wait to show you that. One of the things that we need to recognize is that the church obviously began when Jesus was still alive. When Jesus called disciples to himself, and even the 12 apostles to himself, but he had a lot more followers than that, they were the church. But at that point in the history of the church, they did not define themselves in any way, nor did Jesus direct them to, they did not define themselves as in any way separate from or different from the Jewish faith. The early followers of Jesus considered themselves Jews. The only difference was that they believed that they were privileged to have an understanding and knowledge that the Jewish Messiah had come, and that they had the blessing of his teaching, and then even after Jesus died, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven, the uh, apostles who taught following Jesus' ascension, even they did not at first give any indication of an intention to have a separate religious group apart from the Jews. They went to the temple. You know, we have examples even after Pentecost when the church is officially born, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, we have Peter and John going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. The implication is clearly that during Jesus' life and during the apostolic period after Jesus' life, up until... Uh, Paul, pretty much, you know, some Peter and Paul, and Peter's experience in Caesarea and, and uh, with Cornelius the centurion and all that. Um, the idea was they were still Jews, and they practiced the Jewish faith. They were not looking to split off, and yet um, they did know very clearly that they had a special blessing through understanding that the Messiah had come. They had a sense of the kingdom of God having arrived. To, and they really began to look at the scripture of the Old Testament and understand several things that were critical to their becoming the church as we understand the church. Now, it had always been the case, and, and, and I'll give you this passage, this is God's blessing to Abraham. Basically, it is repeated to Isaac, it is repeated to Jacob, it is referred to by Jeremiah, it occurs over and over and over again. This passage from Genesis 22, which was to, um, to Abraham. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, this is after the sacrifice of Isaac, or the almost sacrifice of Isaac, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and here it is, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. That same comment that all nations will be blessed because of you was to Isaac, to Jacob. It is reiterated in the prophets, in the Psalms, uh, over and over and over again. The idea that while the Jews are the chosen people of God, special and elect in his eyes, that through them, at some time in the future, in some way, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, as the early church, from the time of Jesus on, probably more after Jesus left, where they weren't listening to you know, his direct teaching and training, um, the church began to look back at the Old Testament and began to see places where there was a clear indication of God's intention to do something very particular. Um, I want to go to this one first. Passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. Again, this is just an example. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. 
I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned, profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know, the nations, which means everybody else, not just Israel, will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. At the time of Jesus, and especially the apostolic age following Jesus, the Jewish believers, who were the first believers, started looking back at the Old Testament and seeing places where, where there was a twofold message. One, that Israel did not have a solitary claim on the things of God if they were not obedient to God, which they saw happening, because the Jews were not accepting Jesus as the Messiah. And secondly, that God intended to open this up to everybody. And so the early church, as things started happening in the early church, especially Pentecost and then the, you know, the events with Peter um, bringing a Gentile to faith and the church in Antioch being founded by Peter, by Paul and Barnabas, all of this began to make sense to them. Particularly, the birth of the church was in the second chapter of Acts, Pentecost. When I say the birth of the church, the birth of the Christian church as we know it still hadn't defined itself as anything other than Jewish. But that happened, and I want to give you a passage first that we're going to refer back to. And this is from Joel, the prophet Joel. Joel said, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, sometime in the future. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. And as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now it's important to notice here, verse 31 See, it's talking, before verse 31, it's talking about God sending His Spirit in those days and wonders in the heavens and on the earth about uh, prophecies and visions. Then in verse 31, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment. The assumption by the Jews had always been that the, that was all one event. That there would be prophecies and there would be the outpouring of the Spirit and God's judgment would come and the world would end. What happened was, in the second chapter of Acts, the apostles and disciples of Jesus, and that, 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 there were about, we believe, about 120 of them at that point, they experienced the first half of this. That is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, giving prophecy and miraculous gifts. It was at that point they began to understand that Joel seems to be referring to two events here. The time when God would pour out His Holy Spirit and they would be prophesying in miraculous events, and then later to be the, the, the dreadful day of the Lord, the day of judgment, which would come later on. And if you read Joel, there's nothing inherent in that that says that's all supposed to be one time. So this is the experience that the church had in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, which is the birthday, or the birth, if you will, the, birth, the day of birth of the New Testament church. When the day of Pentecost came, Pentecost, by the way, was the celebration of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. It was 50 days after the Exodus. So from the leaving, uh, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, the Exodus, to arriving at Mount Sinai and Moses receiving the law um, from God on behalf of the Israelites was 50 days. So they called the giving of the law the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. This is a Jewish holiday. A lot of people, Christians today, think that Pentecost is a Christian holiday. Well, it was a Jewish holiday that God acted on for the sake of the early church. All right. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. People would come from all over for the festivals. And if you've got a good study Bible, it'll undoubtedly have a map in there with arrows that show you from Rome and Cyprus and, you know, uh, Cyrene, all over the, the eastern Mediterranean, well, the whole eastern Mediterranean world. 
When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Remember, Judas Iscariot was the only one of the apostles who was not from Galilee, and he's dead by now. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Now this is a very direct um, fulfillment and manifestation of what the prophet Joel had predicted in the first half of his prophecy, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, uh, visions being seen of a manifestation of God's presence there. Now, it's important to note too, uh, we often don't think about this, that the intertestamental period was a period of about 400 years from the time of um, the, the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, it was about 450, until the, the time of Jesus, right about, you know, at the, 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 the turn of the, of the calendar, right, at like 6 BC, somewhere right in there. Well, that 400, 450 year period, there had been no manifestations of the Holy Spirit to the nation of Israel. There were no prophets. There was no divine revelation in any written form or prophetic form. There was no evidence of God's Holy Spirit being there. The first prophet after Malachi in 450 BC was John the Baptist. And it says the Holy Spirit came on John the Baptist. But it was actually recognized amongst the Jewish writings of the intertestamental period that the Holy Spirit was absent from them then. They didn't believe he was dead. But they, they knew he wasn't active. He had not appeared. Because in the Old Testament, you will remember, the Holy Spirit's job was to come on special assignments to inspire prophets, to uh, manifest God's presence, to deliver messages of the Lord. He would come and do a particular act of, uh, as part of God, and then he would recede back to the Father in Heaven. He did not remain. What happens here? is the Holy Spirit, and this was based upon a promise that Jesus gave. We're told Jesus had the presence of the Holy Spirit, and he claimed that. And John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit when he started his ministry and preaching. So that Jesus and John the Baptist were the first two rep, uh, manifestations or presence of the Holy Spirit for over 450 years. And that was a pretty big deal. Okay, uh, Both of them had the Holy Spirit, and it was at that point that what the Messianic Age was ushered in. And that the early church recognized that. They recognized that in Jesus, who they believed that was the Messiah, in the evidence of the Holy Spirit coming back, that things had changed. The Messianic Age that had been predicted in the Old Testament had arrived. They still at that point did not consider themselves as being anything other than Jews who were privileged to be aware of and uh, witness to this new Messianic Age. And again, there was a, they began to interpret this and understand there was a difference in Joel between the, the beginning of the Messianic Age and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the day of the Lord, which would be the day of judgment. Now, this continues. Then Peter, remember they'd just been accused of being drunk. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning, or the third hour, they would call it, because the day started at 6 in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel here, the same passage I just gave you. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And he goes on to finish the quotation from Joel. So this is how the early church, by inspiration of the Spirit, understood the fulfillment of the declaration that had been given in the Old Testament for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Holy, the return of the Holy Spirit, and the coming of the Messianic Age. This was the start of the church. And after the rest of his sermon, which is very powerful, the first great sermon of the book of, the book of Acts, Peter has several of them, Paul has several of them, 
he goes on then, I'm skipping from verse 18 to verse 40, with many other words, he, that is Peter, warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Okay, they had 120, which is about the size of Lakeside Presbyterian Church right now on Sundays. It was 122, I think, that Sunday. Imagine one day, somebody preaches, <laughs> be careful there, somebody preaches, and 3,000 people decide to become Christians. Talk about needing a new building. Uh, that's what happens. Okay. Then it goes on to tell us what that early church looked like immediately. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. <coughs> Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They drove, broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Mm -hmm. This is what the early church looked like. It was born on this day, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 and they then witnessed in power to the rest of the people of Jerusalem. Okay? Now, it's interesting, I said earlier that the, the, the Christians at this point did not consider themselves as, as anything other than Jews. They were Jews who knew the Messiah, and now had experienced the Holy Spirit, which was promised in the Jewish Old Testament, you know, the, the Jewish the Hebrew Bible. You will notice here, it says, they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Well, they would not have been enjoying the favor of all the people in Jerusalem if they had been seen as anything other than Jews, if they had been declaring that they were a new religion. They didn't see themselves that way. They were not seen that way. It took a while, before that became a problem. And it particularly became a problem because Peter and John and others were performing miracles and preaching that Jesus, who had been condemned by the Sanhedrin, crucified by the Romans, was truly the Son of God, the Messiah. And the Sanhedrin wanted them to shut up because they thought it made them look bad, and it undermined their authority. And when they wouldn't shut up, then things started getting bad. And it started this, this you know, downhill uh, roll of, of persecution that led to the stoning of Stephen and other things. But you need to understand that in the early church, they were Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and more than just what they thought the Messiah, that he was also the Son of God and that the Holy Spirit sealed that as being a true belief for the Messianic era to begin. That's how the church started, okay? Now, um, questions about any of that? Bob? Can you back up uh, to the previous verse? Sure. That one? Yeah, uh, verse 17. <clears throat> Can you comment on the last days? And also, the second part of this is that uh, I've heard some of my Pentecostal friends say that this prophecy is actually fulfilled in the Pentecostal movement. They would say that, wouldn't they? Yes. <laughs> Remember, I said it depends on who you, you know, what the church is and how, how it's manifesting the mandate of Scripture. It depends on who you ask. Uh, the Joel, and this is good of you to notice this if you didn't notice it. Peter says, in the last days, God says, that's not what Joel said exactly. Joel said, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. The in the last days, God says, is understood as Peter, we believe, divinely inspired. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. He is speaking by authority and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Is recognizing that this is a new day. This, in effect, is the last days. The Messianic era is a term I've used several times already. That Peter <laughs> is declaring, he's, he's sort of doing a minor interpretation of Joel by declaring that these are the last days, the last era before that you know, coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is the time when the Messiah has come. We are to hear him, accept him, believe in him, honor God in that way, and then the end will come. So the last days is, I believe, Peter's way, again, by inspiration of the Spirit. It's not just Peter making this up, because I don't think, I don't think even he 
could think that fast on his feet. Um, the idea that it is declaring this as the messianic era, this is the messianic age, the last age of God's will for the earth before the last day. All right. Now, yes, the Pentecostals say that the, the Pentecostal movement is, is that, well, the charismatic movement didn't start until about 100 years ago. I don't think God was asleep for 1900 years. All right. Pentecostalism, Pentecostalism, charismatic movement, is very new. And so those who claim that this is a fulfillment of that, I don't think so. I don't, but consent for the very simple reason that I don't think God waited 1,900 years to make His will to be known after He had done all this, and that not and that everybody else had not gotten it wrong for 1,900 years, or had failed to be open to the presence of the Holy Spirit for 1,900 years. Michael, isn't it made clear in this passage too that the speaking in tongues is speaking in the various intelligible languages? No, it doesn't make it clear. In fact, it's not clear at all. Because um, the it's it's not clear whether the the people were speaking in the languages of those other people, or that they were speaking in some unintelligible language, because it suggests that it's an unintelligible language, and that the people were miraculously caused to hear their own their own languages. So we don't know if it was a miracle of speaking or a miracle of hearing. It's not really clear. We do know they were speaking in a, in some unknown language given by the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't then say, it doesn't say Peter was speaking in the language of the Elamites, and John was speaking in the language of the, of the Libyans from Cyrene, and blah, blah, blah. We're not sure how that's working, particularly because later on when Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, he talks about speaking in tongues being unintelligible to people unless you have an interpreter. Because there is no interpreter here, then the suggestion is it was more likely to be a miracle of hearing than it was a miracle of speaking, because there's no interpretation needed. And it was not necessary, uh, because Peter stands up and speaks in Koine Greek, and everybody understands it. Everybody there spoke Koine Greek. The people who were given the glossolalia, which is the theological word for speaking in tongues, the people who were given by the Holy Spirit glossolalia in this point, it wasn't done, as some people have supposed, in order that people could understand them. Because everybody understood Peter, and he spoke one language. Okay, he spoke Greek. So, this, it was really, uh, I believe, I mean, I'm not the first one to say this, but I believe this is correct, that the reason why they were given a miraculous tongue was evidence of the Holy Spirit. People heard from many different languages, with many different native languages, other than Greek, which they all spoke, heard their language as a sign and symbol of the fact that this event was intended for all people everywhere, the nations. Okay. The idea that all nations, back to that thing from you know the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jeremiah, the Psalms, etc., etc., the thing Ezekiel said is that I will make it known to all nations because you Israelites have not been true. All of that, the evidence that all these, this happened when all these people were from all over, you know, the, the Eastern Mediterranean world, which is huge, they all heard in their own language, I believe, was God's way of saying, I want it to be clear that this is for all nations. But it doesn't mean that different ones of the apostles were speaking in different languages. The suggestion is they were speaking in, in an unintelligible language, which miraculously the Holy Spirit caused people to hear it as their own, as a symbol. But then they understood Peter when he spoke in Greek. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Questions about that? This is how the church started. Now, I will say one other thing, because we got into the charismatic question. People confuse two concepts which are separated in the New Testament, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Pentecostals especially get this confused in my experience, and you'd think they'd be the ones that get it straight. The baptism of the Holy Spirit always occurs at the point of salvation. Every example we have is that when somebody is saved, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is never a, a, a directive or an inclination in Scripture, in the New Testament. People are not told, if they're already believers, you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is said several times is that they pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is apparently something that can happen to you more than once, and it happens to people after or post, you know, some time after, 
them having been saved and having been baptized by the Holy Spirit. So the, the only exception, the only one that seems to be a bit of a bugaboo in that is when Philip goes up to the Samaritans. He ministers to the Samaritans, they believe, and then later on, uh, Paul and others go up there, Paul and Barnabas, I think it is, go up, and they say, um, you know, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they say, no, we only, we, only, we only believe in the name of Jesus. They pray for them, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the only case where those two things, that is profession of faith to salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit occur at different times. The, because that's the only example, people have looked at that and said, what is there that's unusual or unique about the Samaritans in that situation that might have caused that to be a unique way of handling it? And it may very well have been that since all of the believers up until then were Jewish, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, they, they um, God in his wisdom decided that he was going to have some special manifestation occur with Barnabas and Paul there as an example of the fact that he, God really means it for the Samaritans too. If it had just been Philip, who was a great guy, deacon, you know, loved him and everything else, but if it had just been him and he said, oh yes, they, they, you know, they accepted Jesus and they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, some of the Jews might not have been quick to, as quick to, under, to accept that. But with Philip's testimony and Paul and Barnabas and others that were there, then they would be more likely to accept the Samaritans because they all experienced the Holy Spirit coming upon them in that sort of second event. Uh, other than that, every case, the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs at the point of salvation, and then the filling of the Holy Spirit, which theologically is identified as a separate thing, which, which is a, filling means that to be, to be given a special blessing of uh, giftedness or of an expression of the gifts of the Spirit or of something else. So those two things are different. Yes? When did the apostles and the disciples receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and when were they filled? Okay, this was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were all baptized with the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. Okay. That was when the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came into them, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, being the expression there, uh, the, the Spirit came into them and didn't leave. Jesus promised, when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and he'll be with you as your comforter, paraclete. So unlike the Old Testament experience, it's not that the Holy Spirit came in for a special assignment and then left. The Holy Spirit came in and baptized and remains in everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ. But then there are other times in which those people may be especially filled by the Holy Spirit for a special purpose, with a special giftedness or strengthening or you know something else, um, like a like a gift of prophecy or something else, something of that sort. All right. I know it's a little complicated, but it's you know. You started it, Bob. You talked about the Pentecostals. Yes, Darlene. It doesn't seem to manifest itself as it did in the Bible times. I often wonder why. Well, um, come to our spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith class. <laughs> uh, we've talked about why it is that it feels like we don't have the same kind of power these days. Um, I, I think it does manifest itself, but not in as uh, dramatic a way. Remember, the gift of the Holy, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Very few of them are immediately visible or noticeable. In fact, I believe the reason why speaking in tongues and miraculous prophetic utterances are the things that happen in several instances when the Holy Spirit comes upon people is because in those cases, God wants everyone around who is witnessing this to know that the Holy Spirit is present. And so he uses the most visible, audible, obvious manifestation of, of the Spirit that, that we have, and that is speaking in, in tongues, which, you know, you don't just pass, that, pass over that. Somebody's speaking in an unintelligible language by the power of the Holy Spirit, people are going to notice that. Paul makes it very clear, I believe, in Corinthians, <clears throat> that speaking in tongues is not, and this is where I disagree, and we, you know, that is the other Protestant faiths dis disagree with uh, Pentecostals. Speaking in tongues is specifically, Paul says, not unique in terms of being the sign of the Holy Spirit. The only reason I believe it is it's often evident is because that way God says, I want everybody to see this, and that one they can see. But the gifts of teaching, of administration, of all sorts of other things, you know, word of prophecy, which sometimes can only seem like a wisdom from God. It may not be perceived as being necessarily miraculous, because prophecy doesn't mean always telling the future. To, be a, to prophesy means to speak God's word. Now that may be something that's going to come later. It may be for uh, future telling, 
but prophetic means to speak the word from God. So um, I believe that the Holy Spirit is very evident today in many ways, perhaps in not in ways of power because we lack faith. I think that's the reason we don't see as much of the power of the Holy Spirit. But I believe he's very much evident today because we, we do have preaching and teaching and gifts of administration and gifts of giving and gifts of healing and there are things like that that are, that are happening every day around the world. And, it's, and by the way, it's almost uniquely in the Western culture that we don't see more miraculous events because we in Western culture are not geared up for it. You know, we'd have trouble believing it if we saw it. And so I think there's reasons for that. Okay? Marvin. <clears throat> On Sunday when you spoke and you talked about receiving the Holy Spirit and when people close their eyes, I believe that that's when some people perhaps were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right. Like you, you're listening to something speak and it's just going right into your heart and you say, oh, I know that I have to do this. And uh, there's no necessarily outward sign. I know right. that's how it happened for me and, and for my wife as well. It's like, yeah. I still... <laughs> you know? yeah. The point at which you say, that's true. Jesus is who he said he is. This is true. It's not just another religion. It's not just what somebody says. This is true. That's the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can convict us of that truth. And so that's one of the signs that the Spirit is present. Becky? Well, it, it seems like when I would go um, on mission trips into Africa, they would have the Holy Spirit on me. And I, I feel that is the evidence of the Holy Spirit, you know, where he, uh, where we prayed for little Billy and her leg and hip was healed and right. she was able to walk. And, you know, um, it's, it's a concentration of faith of the believers there. And I, I think it's, it's very difficult sometimes in the United States where we are split up and have so many different ways of looking at the Bible and beliefs. I don't know, it just seems like um, when we went concentrated in different spots in Africa, we saw more open uh, miracles and things like that. There's um, much more openness to miraculous manifestations of God's power in the other parts of the world. That's what I said about the Western cultures. Now, you will remember when we say, why isn't the Holy Spirit more active? Even Jesus, when he was in his hometown, it's mine, sorry, when he was in his hometown, it says that he could do no more miracles there because of their lack of faith. Even Jesus was limited in his miraculous expressions when the people lacked faith. How do we expect that, to see more of that? Okay. Yes. Uh, in thinking about the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, um, I've always thought of it as, uh, aside from the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that uh, the more I surrender my life, uh, less of me and, and more of the spirit then yeah. it is filling me. Is that? I think that's accurate. I mean, that, uh, we have to be willing to withdraw ourselves with the Lord of Holy Spirit yes. will manifest himself in some way, which is the same as the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say one more thing and then we're going to take a break. I talked about the baptism of the Spirit at the point of salvation. The only, only point where it's, the only example where it seemed like that wasn't the case was in Samaria. And I've told you why I and others think that that may have been a difference. But the fact is that there are different ways in which God chooses to manifest himself through the Spirit in the New Testament. Um, and probably there's no one pattern because he's smart enough to know what's the best way to do it in any particular case. Yeah, our, our desire to try to nail it all down and say there's only one way that God can act is our problem, not his. And so we need to have some understanding, some humility about that, that God may choose to work in different ways at different times. And that doesn't mean that there's something wrong there. Okay. Um, all right, let's take a break. One other thing that we need to realize is that when the church, uh, I've made a, a point several times, that the early church, even after Jesus' resurrection, um, during the time of the early apostles, Peter and John and others, there was no indication from them until later in Acts when, when Peter, um, he's in Joppa and he has this vision of a big sheet coming down from heaven in Acts and it has all sorts of animals, clean and unclean, by Jewish law. And, it, and God says to him, take and eat, Peter. And he goes, absolutely not. I haven't eaten anything unclean since, you know, forever. And God says, don't call anything unclean that I told you is clean, Peter. And he has that vision three times. As soon as that vision is done, there is somebody calling from his front gate. And it's Gentiles. Now, you need to remember, Gentiles and Jews were not allowed to enter each other's homes. 
Jews were considered uh, to have made themselves unclean if they entered a Jewish, uh, a Gentile home or allowed Gentiles to come into their home. So it was a big deal. Well, if these were representatives of Cornelius, the Roman centurion from Caesarea, further up the coast from Joppa, who had been sent, uh, Cornelius had had a vision of God, and the vision had said, send for Peter, my servant Peter, who is in Joppa, to come. There's something he needs to tell you, because Cornelius was what was called a God-fearing Gentile, meaning he believed that there must only be one God. The Jews were the only ones who were monotheistic. And so Gentiles who were seeking after the truth of one God would go to the Jews, the only monotheists around. And so Cornelius was one of those God-fearing Gentiles. He had a vision from God. He sends his servants. As soon as Peter has these visions of, the, uh, of all animals now being clean to eat, in other words, the Jewish law is being set aside in that regard, these representatives from Cornelius appear at his gate. And they're standing outside the gate calling out to him because they were not allowed to enter a Jewish home. And Peter asks who they are, they explain, and Peter says, come in. Huge deal. You don't even notice it unless you realize what that would have meant for a Jew to invite Gentile messengers from a Roman soldier to enter his home. They spent the night there. The next day, uh, Peter went with them up to Caesarea. When he arrives, he goes into the home of Cornelius, another no-no to a Jew if he was going to follow the strict law. He ministers, he preaches to Cornelius and his family and friends, they receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is manifest, they are saved, they become believers in Jesus. Those are the first Gentile converts. Okay? Prior to that, there was no sense in which the Jews thought that this belief in the Messiah, the belief in Jesus as King and Lord, was anything other than a fulfillment of the Jewish faith. No idea that it was going to be something outside the Jewish religion. There was not a sense, and, and I don't think we often think about this, there was not a sense by the Jews that they needed to evangelize. There was no sense of evangelism. It's almost as though they didn't get the Great Commission yet, even though it had happened earlier. In fact, um, in Matthew 28, this is the Great Commission. This is the last thing Jesus says before he said ascended into heaven. We, we read, then the eleven disciples, eleven, because of course the twelfth one, Judas Iscariot, is now dead. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now again, this happened quite a bit before the thing with Peter, and yet apparently it hadn't sunk in yet what this meant. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Even though the promise from Abraham on, over and over and over again, had been that the message would be to all nations, even though Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them, still they hadn't quite gotten it. They still thought they were just a part of Judaism. It wasn't until Peter's vision of all animals now being clean, because God said so, and of Cornelius and his family becoming believers, and then later Philip and the, Samaria, the people of Samaria, then the church in Antioch, the Gentile believers in Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, and then it started snowballing from there in terms of Paul and Barnabas' missionary journeys to uh, Gentile parts of the world. Okay, One of the things that, that the church came to understand as this began to miraculously happen, and it was miraculous, Paul, you know, Peter seeing visions, the Holy Spirit being miraculously manifest more than just once. We have the, the miracle of the manifestation at Pentecost amongst the followers of Jesus. You also have the manifestation of the Samaritans, who were not Jews, to the Cornelius and his family, who were Gentiles. Um, you, so you get these multiple kind of manifestations of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a sign of the fact that God was miraculously building this, this new body, this new Israel. In fact, there's very clear sense in, in the New Testament that this is the new Israel. These are the people who have accepted God's plan and intention of his new Messiah, Jesus, of his Messiah, Jesus, and they are becoming the new Israel, and that it is a miraculous creation of God. The, the early church was not just a bunch of people who got together for fellowship and said, we all believe in Jesus. 
They were miraculously created. The church of Jesus Christ is a miraculous creation of the Holy Spirit. And that's a critical thing for us to understand. Even today, the church that exists in the 21st century, now we talk about the invisible church and the visible church. There are some people who are part of the church who probably don't really mean it. They are not, they are part of the visible church and not the invisible church. They haven't really committed their hearts to Christ. But the fact that God has continued to call for 2,000 years to call people together by His Holy Spirit to touch their hearts and say, this is true. Jesus really is the Son of God who will forgive you of your sins. That is a miraculous creation of God. And that is the ecclesia, the, the, the assembly, the church. The, almost everywhere in our New Testament that you get the word church, and it's used just not as often as you think in the Gospels, only twice in Matthew, for instance, but the, the, later on in Paul, especially, in, in Revelation it talks about the church. In almost every case, it's not talking about the small body and community of believers. It's talking about the universal uh, gathering or assembly of people who believe in Jesus Christ. The church invisible. In fact, historically, they talked about the church triumphant and militant. Meaning the church, both those that are alive today, uh, the militant, and triumphant, those that have gone on before. But will be rejoined together as one part of the body of Christ eventually. That is a miraculous creation by God. Uh, most often in the New Testament, as I said, when the church, uh, when the Holy Spirit is manifest, almost always it is the speaking in tongues that is the, is the present evidence of it, but, but I believe that's because that's the most visible. Later on in uh, the letters to the Corinthians, who were having trouble apparently with, with wrong ideas about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Paul says very plainly, you know, God gives different gifts to different people. Not everybody gets the same gifts. And he says, does everybody prophesy? And the clear, this is a diatribe. It's actually, it's a literary technique uh, that was used in those days. Does everybody prophesy? The answer is clearly supposed to be no. Does everyone interpret? Does everyone speak in tongues? In each case, the answer is supposed to be no. And yet the Holy Spirit gives gifts, you know, to those as he desires. So not everybody is intended to speak in tongues. The charismatic movement has gotten it wrong, according to Paul, not according to Ross, but according to Paul, when they say that speaking in tongues is the evidence of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Paul does not agree with that. And I'll take Paul over any Pentecostal preacher any time, or Presbyterian preacher, or anybody else. Ron? If you've heard it, then I think what you said is right. You know, it's really strange. Yeah. And yet, that's a common belief today. Um, so, the, the early believers thought of themselves as Jews. They thought that they were the Jews uh, that were, at that point, uniquely aware of the fact that the Messiah had come. And they had a few other characteristics that were different. They were led by the teaching of the apostles. They had a unique access to God's teaching through the apostles' teaching, which the word for which is dedicate. Somebody asked me the other day, Michael, you asked me what the dedicate was. Didache, uh, and I told you it was a like a immediate post post apostolic teaching document, like a, a catechism that was used. Well, the word literally means the teaching. Okay, it's where we get the word didactic, which is, means to teach. Um, well, they had the apostles' teaching or the didache of the apostles. They had an understanding through that teaching of the uh, meaning of the life, death, and exaltation of Jesus, his enthronement as, as the messianic king and lord, and they had a sense. <laughs> of a future eschatological consummation, which was the dreadful day of the Lord that Joel had talked about. Again, it was at this point in time that they came to understand the prophecies of Joel and some of the other prophecies in the Old Testament <coughs> as separating the start of the Messianic age, when the Holy Spirit would be given, from later the day of the Lord, which is called the dreadful day of the Lord in Joel, which would be the day of consummation and judgment. So that was one of the characteristics that, that did make them different, is they had the teaching of the apostles, which gave them an understanding of the nature and person of Jesus, and also of what the future held for them. Now, another significant mark of the early church was their simplicity. Um, they didn't have great basilicas, um, they didn't even have storefront churches back then. In fact, we don't have one model. There, it's too often we tend to want to think that, okay, this is how it must have been done, and then impress that on them. There's an example which we just read uh, in Acts where they were gathered in the courtyards of the temple. Well, probably because that was the only place that was big enough for them to get together. 
And at that point, they were not doing anything that the Jewish authorities had a problem with. So they could gather in the temple courtyards, which were huge. I mean, gigantic. So they could join you know, together in the open courtyards or in the colonnades, because it was warm weather back there. Um, and other than that, they gathered in homes, in Christian homes. This is something that we have as a mark in both the description of the church in Acts and also in Paul, that there were many home churches, that they would gather for a time of prayer and of teaching, of breaking of bread, which is communion, and also of eating together. Um, and in fact, they, some of them ran into problems with that. Apparently there was gluttony going on, and there were some people who were you know, hoarding all the shrimp. <laughs> they get to the buffet first and eat all the shrimp before anybody else got there. Actually, they wouldn't have because at this point they were all Jewish and Jews don't eat shrimp. But, you know, you get the point. Um, but there was a sense of simplicity, meeting in private homes, not having, you know, temples or, or gigantic places for gathering. In fact, quite the contrary of any sort of show of um, wealth or of being a significant movement, they went the other direction. And that is, a lot of people who were very poor were attracted to this movement, this assembly, this early Christian church, which again, to begin with, just thought of itself as, as enlightened Jews. They thought they were Jews who knew the Messiah had come in Jesus. But uh, widows, slaves, uh, poor people, and in those days there was not the social net that we have. Now the temple would distribute some, some goods to, to people who had need, but they, there was no social security, there was no sense of that. Uh, often widows and orphans, the reason the scripture talks about widows and orphans so much is that some, if somebody didn't make a point of taking care of them, they starved. There was no way for them to be taken care of. Well, the church took it upon themselves not only to welcome these people in, but to care for their needs. You know, we had that, that um, here. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with bad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. Uh, where is it? Okay, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They cared for the people in their midst who were poor, which was kind of unheard of. Uh, I remember one time I was asked to talk in a, in a public classroom for some strange reason uh, about, I don't remember the particular topic, but it was something having to do with the history of Christianity. And I mentioned the fact that public schools and hospitals and orphanages were invented by Christians. Well, the teacher who was Jewish said, wait a minute. You know, Christians invented public schools, and I said, yes. He said, Jews had schools a long time before Christianity came along. And I said, well, yes, Jews had schools for Jews. Christians had schools for anybody. All right, the idea of a public school of any, that anybody could come to really was a Christian invention. The idea of hospitals, where you would care for people who were sick without charging them back then, um, was invented by Christians. The idea of orphanages, where you would take in orphans who had nobody else to care for them and take care of them. Those are all Christian inventions. And they really are an extension of what we found in the first century church, in the very early parts, the days of the Christian church. Um, and the, but probably the biggest single uh, example that we draw from the early church is that fellowship, that unity, or koinonia is the Greek word for it, which, literally, which means fellowship. <clears throat> there was a sense in the early Christians of being uh, united together, no matter what their background had been, because they shared together in their belief in Jesus Christ. They were bound to Christ, and so they were bound to each other. It was a natural occurrence for them. Um, their Today, every once in a while, you'll, you'll hear somebody who's a Christian say, oh yeah, you know, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, but I really don't have any use for the church, I don't go to church, I don't have anything else. I recently had somebody tell me, who claims to be a Christian, that he thought Christians were the worst people in the whole world. He, he didn't care if he ever had anything else to do with Christians. That person is in trouble, spiritually. Anybody who says that is in trouble, spiritually. The first century church, and I believe that if we have our heads screwed on straight, we believe this today, the first century church believed there was no such thing as a Christian in isolation. You could not really be a believer in Jesus unless you were part of his body, which is the church. I said earlier that the ecclesia, the assembly, the church of Jesus Christ was a miraculous creation of God. It wasn't just a bunch of people who decided they liked to get together because we had potluck twice, you know, once a month. <laughs> It was a body of people who had been miraculously called of God and bound together as part of the fellowship of the body of Christ. 
And again, to the first century believers, to suggest that somebody could be a believer in Jesus and do so in isolation without being part of that fellowship, that koinonia, would have been considered absurd. It's, it's a complete, you know, um, oxymoron. You can't do that. Today, people get that wrong, and they think, I can be a Christian in isolation. Really? I mean, you're part of the body of Christ. In fact, the person who was on the phone that the person told me, I don't ever want to have anything to do with the Christians again. I hung up and I told Carolyn, I said, you know, I was trying to be gracious about it, but if he says something like that again, I'm going to give him both barrels. <laughs> You're talking about my brothers and sisters. You're talking about the body of my Lord Jesus. So, why don't you just cut it out? Okay? Just... Pardon? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking the bread. I believe that initially in Jerusalem, they kind of thought the Lord was going to come back almost any time. Right. And they really didn't carry on with their normal work and normal activities. They were just so enthralled and so excited. So that, you know, uh, as things gone on, went on and Jesus didn't come back and the kingdom didn't get started, people kind of went back to work and carried on their normal lives as well as their Christian faith. Right, it's true. In fact, um, the, this is, <clears throat> they didn't expect Jesus to come back anytime. In fact, Paul did. And so early on, there's several things that we realized looking, looking in hindsight. One of the reasons that they didn't write down a lot of the things like the, the Gospels were not written for quite a few years afterwards is because they thought Jesus would be coming back by Tuesday. I mean, you know, uh, we're, we've got other things to do before he returns. It wasn't until the Apostles actually started dying out and there was some concern that the message, in terms of a clear understanding of the message, might be lost because the Jesus was tarrying, he was not returning yet, that they actually decided we better write this stuff down. It's also the reason why in the early church, they didn't start out with any kind of organization at all. They didn't start out saying, okay, we need um, a hierarchical you know, job structure. You know, we, don't, we need a chart. They didn't have any of that sense because they didn't think they were going to be around that long. Which takes us sort of into the organization of the early church. At first, the early church, remember they came out of a Jewish, the Jewish faith, or part of the Jewish faith, in which the religious leaders were also the legal authorities. The Sanhedrin was responsible not only for being in charge of the Jewish faith, but also were the legal authorities. Now under, in this time, underneath the authority of the Romans, there were certain things they couldn't do, but they would try cases, they were the court of the land, as well as being the religious authorities of the land. So, uh, early on, the, Jew, the Jewish Christians thought they were still underneath that authority structure, and they didn't bother to build anything else other than believing that the apostles were anointed by Jesus himself to teach and to lead in that regard. Well, um, after a while, they, but the apostles were not given any legal authority. The apostles did not have any authority to determine legal issues like the Sanhedrin had had for the Jews. So there was not the same balance there. It was simply, they simply didn't have any organization as an institution in the early church other than the teaching of the apostles. Uh, then we get into the first great sort of organizational crisis of the church had to do with the fact that um, you had Hebraic Jews, which meant that were, you know, that focused on speaking Hebrew and had Hebrew names, etc. But because of the influence of Greek, or the Hellenizing influence against Hellas was the ancient name of Greece, the Greeks who spoke, or I'm sorry, the Jews who spoke Greek more than they did Hebrew, which is why the Septuagint, the Greek translation of uh, the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible had to be done because there were Jews who forgot how to speak Hebrew. Well, there was a fight between those people all the time. There were disagreements between the Hebraic Jews who thought that it was a crime that we would let Greece, the, the Greek culture and language take over so much, and those who had been raised that way and they thought that was natural. There was always a conflict. In fact, that conflict came to be, by the first century, represented by the Pharisees, who were the super Hebraic ones, and the Sadducees, who tended to be the, you know, the Hellenized Jews. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, and their fight was basically a historic extension of the disagreement between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenized Jews. You got that? We talked about that before? Well, what happens is, in the early church, that same problem carried over. And apparently, the, since there were a lot of people who were poor and they were trying to care for the needs of people, the whoever was handing the stuff out apparently was not being fair about it, either intentionally or unintentionally. It may not have been intentional, but the accusation was made that the the Hebraic Jews, the more the more Hebrew-oriented Jews, the widows and orphans from that side, were getting more stuff than the Hellenized or the Greek 
uh, widows and orphans. This is the passage from Acts 6. This is the first example we have that they develop any kind of organized structure in terms of leadership in the church, beyond the apostles and their teaching. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, again, those who spoke Greek were more influenced by the Greek culture, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. Those who spoke Hebrew were more Hebraic in their approach because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, the apostles, remember there were eleven because it, uh, Judas Iscariot, then they, re, uh, they, they drew lots to appoint uh, Matthias to be the twelfth. And there's, I keep talking about how they thought of themselves as being Jews. This was still part of the Jewish. The twelve apostles were seen and probably intended by Jesus as being the new Israel because there were 12 tribes of Israel. The idea of 12 tribes of Israel was the basic building block of the Old Testament belief of what they were as a people. So Jesus appointed 12 apostles because those 12 apostles symbolized the new Israel, the new 12, if you will. All right. So, um, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. That's literally what it says, to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and of wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. This is the Stephen who later on is martyred, the first Christian martyr. Also Philip, Philip the Evangelist, who evangelized the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch, etc., those are the only two we hear anything else about after this, is Stephen and Philip. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So even priests were coming over. Now, it is of interest that... Uh, the seven that were named as deacons, these are the first deacons of the church, those who would care for the practical needs as opposed to those who were responsible for the teaching and preaching and ministry of the word. All seven of these men have Greek names. So because the accusation had been made that the Hebraic Jews were being cared for and not the Greek Jews, then they made sure that the deacons were Greek so they would be more inclined to be fair about this. And again, two of them, Stephen and, and Philip, we hear about. The other five, we don't know anything more about than what's listed here. Yes? Do we ever hear anything more about Matthias? About who? Matthias, who they chose to be the We don't know. All well, we know is that he got elected. Uh, in fact, we don't, we don't hear a lot about the others. There's traditions for various other ones. But for instance, Thomas. We don't know anything about Thomas after his profession of faith. Um, I'm just wondering if they jumped the gun and the 12th one was really God's choice of Saul. <laughs> <laughs> well, the... the um, Let's talk about that, about apostles. You know, in fact, I'll get into that right now since you've raised it because we're talking about the leadership kinds of things. The 12 apostles, minus Judas Iscariot, and he was replaced by Matthias, was a clear, I believe, intention by Jesus to create the new Israel. The church would be the, the symbol of the new Israel, the ones that truly are, are God's people, you know, fulfilling God's expectations for them. Now, um, Paul, throughout his whole ministry, he was planting churches, he was appointing elders. Paul apparently had an opposition, and one of the things they opposed him by is saying, you're not an apostle. You know, you're not the boss of me. Who are you to tell us what to do? Well, Paul did declare to be himself to be an apostle because the definition of an apostle is they had to be taught by Jesus. Okay, this is it. When they, when they were selecting Matthias, for instance, it was either uh, Barsabbas or Matthias. They had to draw between the two. They said the two criteria are you had to have known Jesus' teaching and you had to have witnessed him resurrected. Okay, that was the two criteria. Well, Paul said, on the road to Damascus, I witnessed the resurrected Christ and then he had miraculous visions of teaching from Jesus. So he claimed the right to be an apostle miraculously even after Jesus' death and resurrection. Okay, But scripture does say that Barnabas was recognized as an apostle. In fact, it goes on to say that there are a couple of other people, Junius uh, and, and Andronicus and James, the Lord's brother, were also recognized as apostles, which meant there were opportunities for more people to be apostles. Now, apostle means, a, a disciple is one that comes and learns from. 
Okay, that's what a disciple is, a learner, an apprentice. An apostle is like the opposite of that. He's one that, that goes out to carry the message. And in the Gospels, um, for instance, we're I'm preaching on Mark, Jesus chose the twelve and anointed them to drive out demons and heal people from sicknesses and to then be specially trained by him, to be the foundation on which the church would be built. The point is that the apostles were supposed to be, the after Jesus' ascension, they were going to be the foundation on which the church was built. Um, the idea of Barnabas, who also, along with Paul, were especially anointed to be, able to be foundation builders, to, to plant churches, to establish them, um, is legitimate. It fits the definition, really, of what apostles were supposed to be about. There are people today who claim to be apostles. There's a whole movement who claim that they are, they take the title apostle. I don't believe so. <clears throat> I believe that because Paul had to argue so hard as to why he deserved the title apostle, I don't think it's a title that exists for today. I'm not alone in that. I believe that there were more than just the 12, very few more, not a lot, than the 12 who were named apostles because they were foundational to the establishing of the church in the first century. You know, between, in the generation that was, um, you know, alive when Jesus died and was resurrected. But I don't believe it's legitimate for people to claim the title of apostle today. I do not believe that's a position that was carried on. You know, the, the church that was down here that's now been turned into T.O. Corp., the insurance place, you know, this little church that was empty there for a while, that belongs to some, some church group that's headquartered somewhere in the States. And before I, Carolyn and I came to this church, the people here had talked to them about that building. And in order to be able to find out about it, they had to call some guy in, like, New York, I think it was, whose title was the Apostle, blah, 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 blah. I don't think so. Okay? I don't believe that Apostle, because of the nature of that position, that was a first century. Once the scriptures were written, you know, so that the, the word of the Lord did not have to come just verbally anymore like it had through the apostles. Once the scriptures were written and the church was established, I don't believe the role of apostle is, is called for anymore. And I don't believe that anybody deserves to be called apostle. Um, so there, that's what I think. Um, <laughs> don't be you can disagree if you want. Um, but at that point, we had, I mean, this is deacons. We had the apostles then, who were the teachers and preachers, and the deacons. We then began to have identified elders. For instance, at first, James, the brother of Jesus, who was the head of the Jerusalem council, was not considered an apostle. He got named that later. Uh, but initially, he was just one of the elders. And in fact, in Acts, when they talk about the early church, they talk about the council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, for instance, where was a gathering of the apostles and elders. So we began to get the sense in which there were elders whose responsibility included preaching and teaching, but not being, you know, one of the, the very select group of those who established and spoke the word of God uh, as apostles. Um, they were responsible for leading the church, for um, being those who taught and directed and guided, and James, you know, James the brother of Jesus, James the just, was one of those. And then later on, they identified him as having been probably, you know, almost certainly apostolic in terms of his, his level of authority. Um, we don't get a lot of understanding about elders in, or even deacons other than what I just read you, in the book of Acts or in, in other of Paul's writings until you get to the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. In 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, we do get descriptions of the uh, characteristics for apostles, I'm sorry, for elders and uh, deacons. Now. This is from Timothy 5. Paul writes to Timothy, uh, who is the, a pastor in Ephesus at this point. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone, so that everyone, so that others may take warning. I charge you, in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels, to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands means don't be too quick to anoint somebody as being this kind of leader, because this is an important thing. We have earlier in Timothy this description. 
of the characteristics of an elder. Now, you'll notice here that it's, it says in verse uh, 1, an overseer. Um, the, the word, this word often gets translated bishop. And so there's a question about bishops and elders. The thing is, in, Timoth in Titus, rather, uh, bishop and elder are used uh, interchangeably. Plus, when Paul is returning from the third missionary journey, he doesn't actually go to Ephesus because he's afraid he'll get stuck there for a while. He lands at Miletus, and he sends for the elders of the church in Ephesus to come down and meet him because he wants to talk to them, but he doesn't want to get into Ephesus because, again, he's afraid he won't get away because he's anxious to get back to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So he brings them down. Well, in that passage in Acts, they call them elders in places and, and uh, bishops in places. So there seems to be, and this word overseer, which is sometimes translated bishop, seem to be interchangeable. The, the church, down through history, has divided on how to interpret that. Um, the, the churches that are Presbyterian in their orientation, pres, uh, pres, uh, presbyter uh, is the word for elder. Okay? When we talk about elders in our church, we are a Presbyterian church because we are ruled by elders. When you get old and you get farsighted, you know what that's called? Presbyopia. Presbyopia. Your eyes get old. You get farsighted. You know, you, I mean, you can't focus anymore. That's presbyopia because you have elder eyes, literally. So presbyter or presber, uh, you know, the presbyteros means elder. That interpretation of elders has led to the idea of churches that are run by sessions or boards of elder as being the ruling body. Because the word is also used episkopos, which means bishop, which is translated overseer, and even though those things are used interchangeably. Some churches have decided, and this became true of the Catholic churches, Anglican churches, Orthodox churches, Methodist churches, for instance, they have decided that there should be one person who is the senior elder, which they call a bishop. And the bishop, in some cases, has absolute authority to make decisions. Interestingly enough, the bishop in the Methodist church probably has more authority than the bishop in the Catholic church. The bishop in the Methodist church says, okay, you minister, go there, you minister, go there. And the congregation, again, Bishops who are smart listen to the congregations, but technically they don't have to. They can send whoever they want to go, wherever they want. Uh, and so that idea that there's a senior elder called a bishop that runs everything, that is a, di a different model of government. In fact, there are three models of churches nowadays. There is the Presbyterian model, where have el elders run the church. That's Presbyterians, Reformed Church uh, in, in America, etc., etc. Then there are Episcopal churches, which are Catholic, uh, Anglican, Methodist. Then there are congregational churches where the local church is autonomous, um, although not often as autonomous as they wish. Uh, Baptist churches, congregational churches, Church of Christ, those are congregational churches. Although, talk to a Southern Baptist church in the United States and ask them whether or not they feel like the Southern Baptist Convention doesn't have some control over them, okay? Um, but technically, those are the three kinds of churches, and some of it has to do with the difference interpretation of what these words are, okay? So, reading this, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer, episcopal, bishop, but, again, it's interchangeable with elder, desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. I wonder how anybody gets to be an elder. <laughs> if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Okay? So, in the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul gives us more instruction. But well, we need to understand that throughout the early church, there were first apostles, and when they talk about the gifts and the spirit, then prophets, which that gets interchanged with pastors, teachers. Pastors, teachers, they often talk about. Um, elders, who were responsible not only for teaching and pastoring, but also for ruling. For, like the gifts of administration are identified as being part of what the elders are supposed to be responsible for. And then you get deacons and other people in authority in the church. 
And some of it, I really believe, is just interpretation of particular words, like the difference in episcopos and presbyteros, literally bishop and uh, elder, even though those words are clearly used interchangeably in Titus and, and Acts, uh, has, has created two completely different approaches to how church authority works, how church polity works. Questions about any of that? Yes? Uh, okay, they must first be tested. Now, is it the, the church at large testing them? Who is, who is doing the testing? Uh, well, see, we strap them to a... <laughs> we dunk them in a rip, no. Um, the, the idea is that the authority within the church that currently exists should be responsible for determining whether or not someone is eligible by their conduct in life and professional faith to be either, either an elder or a deacon. The way it's usually done, the way it's done in our church, for instance, uh, and there are this is prescribed in the Book of Order, which is the Book of Polity for the Presbyterian Church, that you have a nominating committee, an independent committee. And that, that nominating committee uh, reviews the people who are eligible, who are members, who you know, meet the requirement, they come back to the session, the Board of Elders, and they will recommend a, um, candidates for positions of elder and deacon. Uh, if there are no objections from the session, and it's not even so much I don't believe that they give approval as that they don't have objection, then that uh, slate of candidates for elder and deacon are presented to the body, and the body is to decide, is there anyone on here that does not meet these requirements, um, or do we accept them in that role? And if so, they then vote on it, and if they are elected in the body, they, they, they are ordained then as elders or deacons. We just went through that in our church. Yes? The elders with elder vision are far-sighted. There you go, they're far-sighted. Elder also meaning the mature, older people who yeah. have not just tomorrow in mind, but a long time. A long right. Time. Yeah. yeah, that they have, they have a maturity, a wisdom, yeah. uh, for right. seeing. Now, the first place in which the church really broke, I'm going to go just a few more minutes and we'll stop. The first place that the church really began to break away from Judaism was first, and people don't often think about this, but first in the events and testimony of Stephen in Acts 6, when Stephen, one of the deacons, who was also a man full of the Holy Spirit, who was a preacher, he um, is, because he's preaching, they grab him and they took calling him to account for himself. Well, he preaches starting through, at the start of the Old Testament, he preaches all the Old Testament basically in one sermon in order to demonstrate how this all leads up to Jesus. But then in the process, he declares that those who will not accept Jesus as the Christ are not the true church. In fact, it's, it's reasonable to say if you read the sermon of Stephen and how he concludes it, that Stephen really was the first one to realize uh, and to advocate even in this one sermon before he's martyred, that temple worship and observance of the law are no longer necessary requirements to truly be the people of God. That it is belief in the Messiah Jesus, whom God sent, as being God's own Son, divine Messiah, which is not what they expected. Um, Peter preaches, or uh, I'm sorry, Stephen preaches that. And that's really the first place where there's a suggestion that there is some, there's cause for some real break between the Jewish faith and Christianity. And then, as I said, you get Peter's uh, vision of the cleanliness of all things to eat, and then his interaction with Cornelius and his family and friends, and they're becoming Christians. The fact that when he made that trip, he invited Jews, uh, Gentiles into, into the place where he was staying. He went into Gentile home. He had table fellowship with Gentiles in Caesarea, which is something he got accused of later. All of that, plus Paul and Barnabas, uh, preaching in Antioch and having Gentiles convert to the faith in Jesus led to Acts 15. Acts 15 was the place where the Council of Jerusalem, that is the elders, and it says apostles and elders, with James, the brother of Jesus, as the head. They considered, does a person have to become a Jew in order to be, be a believer in Jesus, in order to be part of the church, the fellowship, the ecclesia, the, the assembly of believers? And the decision was, no, they don't. That, um, and, and the main reason was because Paul and Barnabas and Peter and everybody else is testifying to the fact that God called these people. He anointed them. He demonstrated that by, by giving, him the baptism of the, giving them the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
if God has already done all that without them having the law, who are we to come behind that after the fact and suggest they now need to start obeying the law? Hasn't God already demonstrated the fact that they're okay the way they are and that by believing in Jesus, that's all they had to do? Well, the council in Jerusalem says that makes sense. God has already demonstrated this fact that he's called them and he's saved them and they profess their faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit's come upon them and that's all we need. We're not going to come along later, you know, and try to try to tag on something else that God didn't require in the first place. So they decided at the Council of Jerusalem in James 15, um, and this is declared by James, the brother of Jesus, in his speech, that uh, the, the Gentiles, by faith in Jesus, are accepted into the church, they are accepted to be saved, and they do not have to do anything else. Now, as we've talked about a number of times, he also says, but... Um, we advise you, Gentile believers in Jesus, to abstain from certain practices. Don't eat food that's been uh, offered to idols. Don't eat the meat of strangled animals from which the blood has not been properly drained out. Don't, um, you know, don't consume blood, which one of the things Gentiles used to do is they would mix blood with their drinks. I thought it was protein, I guess. <laughs> and then from immorality. You know, I mentioned the fact that one of the other things they did, you know, meat with blood in it could mean meat that's not been properly butchered so that it was drained of blood, which the Jews required. That's part of being kosher. It could also admit that something they used to do is to, you know, cut the limb off of a living animal and, cause, and try to keep the animal alive because that way the rest of the meat didn't rot before they were ready to eat it. And there's a cruelty associated with that. So, um, but the reason that James says, follow these rules, is not because those things were necessary for salvation, but because they were necessary for witnessing. Because those were some of the things that the Jews had the biggest problem with the Gentiles over. And so they were saying, in order to be a witness, a pro proper witness, don't do these things, because if you do, you, you're liable to blow your witness with the Jews, and we don't want to do that. Okay. Um, I think we've gotten a pretty good idea. I had some other stuff, but it's getting a little bit, a little bit more you know, down to the details that I'm not sure we need to deal with. Um, any questions about any of that so far? <coughs> Anything? Now that Becky's ready to go back to Tennessee and talk to some of the churches she used to go to. Um, again, one of the things, too, we talked about that one of the four marks of the church is to be one. The idea, that along with the idea that the church is, is miraculously created by the Holy Spirit. One of the strongest verses to testify to that is 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Paul says... By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So it is the act of the spirit that baptizes us. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Into one body, Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink one spirit. So when you are saved, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, you drink one spirit, it doesn't matter where, uh, spirit, doesn't matter where you come from, and... It is by a, a divine, a miraculous act of the Spirit that we become part of the Ecclesia, the body of Christ. It is a miraculous creation of God the Holy Spirit that we can never... And when you talk about the church, you always have to keep in mind that it is, it is a matter of the, the divine act of the Holy Spirit to call us together. You know, we're not just friends. We're not just colleagues. We're not just people who face in the same direction on Sunday morning. We are miraculously bound together by an act of the Holy Spirit. That's what the church is. We are one holy, apostolic, Catholic. All right? Not necessarily in that order. Catholic and apostolic. Um, questions about the church, about ecclesiology? Are we good on that? You've got a good sense of what the theology, the New Testament theology of the church is all about? Carolyn? I hesitate to ask this because it might be a big question. But... Um, We've talked about the church being the body of Christ. Right. The church is also referred to as the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. Is it this? Is it interchangeable with the kingdom of God, or is? See, the, the only hard part about that is the kingdom of God, yeah. because Jesus. Is, there is so many different interpretations of what Jesus meant about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the number one topic of Jesus' preaching and teaching. He talks more about the kingdom of God than anything else. By the way, you know what the second most common thing he talks about is? Um, money. Oh. What we do with our money. Okay. That's a different term. <laughs> but the kingdom of God, it's difficult to, to nail down what Jesus means by that. I think the best understanding of it is that Jesus 
when, when he talks, he reads about the kingdom of God from Scripture, he says, today this Scripture has been fulfilled in your presence. The, the best way to understand that is the kingdom of God is manifest in the presence of Jesus. That he is the incarnation of the kingdom of God in our midst. When we receive him, we receive the kingdom of God. That he is the incarnate manifestation of God's plan for the future. And in some ways, since we're the body of Christ, we are the incarnation of Jesus. Exactly. We become, we are part of Jesus. That's what I was saying when the guy was saying, oh, I don't like Christians, they're all terrible, I don't want to, uh, you know, part of me is, I want to smack him. It's good we're on the phone. <laughs> because he's talking about my Lord, yeah. as well as my brothers and sisters. Right. Okay, but... The, um, the, the model of the body of Christ, the church as the body of Christ, is a uniquely Pauline thing. He develops that idea, and it particularly, it seems to be a mechanism that he uses, or a literary tool that he uses, in order to emphasize the fact, two things. One, if you're part of the body of Christ, you, if you're part of the church, this, you can't opt out. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh, well... I don't really need this anymore. You know, get rid of it. You're locked in. It is a miraculous, uh, you are bound to the other brothers and sisters. That's part of it. The other part is that every part of the body has a purpose, just like every person is miraculously gifted in some way. Every person in the church has one or more miraculous gifts of the Spirit for the sake of the rest of the body, it says. And, you know, the I can't save the foot, I don't need you, etc. Paul talks about that. So, Paul uses this, it's, it's not so much a, uh, a, a theological significance, so much as it is a practical metaphor that Paul uses the body. Okay. Um, I, think he, I think it's a brilliant way, I think Paul was inspired as he was with everything else, to use that as a metaphor for how we need each other, how we're locked into each other, how each of us has something to offer, and none of us can say, you're not important enough to be around, or you know, what are you doing, or why are you here? We are all needed. We're all part of it. And so Paul uses that, I think, inspired metaphor of the body of Christ. But that is a uniquely Pauline thing. And then later, after he has created the body of Christ's image, then he comes back and talks about Jesus as the head of the church, sort of expanding that body analogy. Um, it's, it's a great one, but I don't think there's, I don't think we can attach any theological import to that metaphor itself. It's just a very practical and inspired way for us to understand the nature of the church. Well, yes. except for that we are doing doing God's work on the earth right. because we have bodies. <laughs> you know, we are bodies, right. we are gifted. Yeah. So it's very there, it's very practical, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the the church as the body of Christ is not theolog theologically important in the same way that say Jesus as the Son of God is. Right. Okay, there's something inherently theologically critical about that. You can't do away with that. I think that there's extremely useful, valuable, um, you know, the, the body of Christ as an image for the church is terrific, you know, and inspired by, by God. But there's not any the inherently theological, critical aspect to it like there is Jesus as the Son of God, for instance. Okay? I don't know if that I'm making any sense there. Go ahead. The church is the bride of Christ, though. Is yep. Husbands love your wives. Wives right. obey your husband. We know that Christ loves us. Yep, absolutely. And we need to obey. And, right. Uh, I had a lot of trouble with this first. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? I felt like my family was out of control. My first wife and I would argue back and forth with each other. She'd say, love your wife. And I'd yeah. say, obey your husband. <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck on that. You know? Yeah, no one's going to win that one. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, and it's very true. And, I, and the bride of Christ, by the way, is not just Pauline. You know, that comes in elsewhere. That's in Revelation, for instance. So John uses the, the bride of Christ image, which is very, very powerful. Okay, thank you all very much. You know everything about the church? Becky has something to tell her little church is back home.